Holy Father, we are so blessed to be together in your presence. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us, around us, and within us. We have come, Lord, to hear your voice. We only want to hear from you. We want a word from you that will change our lives forever. We're not content with mere Christianity. We want a fresh taste of eternal life. For this is life eternal, that we may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, oh, Father, whisper to every heart your desire for each and every one of us. Manifest your glory among us here today. For we have not just come to church to meet the family, but we have come to church to meet you. And so, Father, we look forward to seeing you and hearing your word for us for today. For we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. I regard it as an awesome responsibility to stand before the people of God and to minister his word. The Apostle Peter wrote, 1 Peter 4, If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Let him speak the very words of God to you. And I want that the things that will be discussed this morning will be a word of God sown into the recesses of your own heart that will bring change to your lives. I remember on my retirement from my work in Jamaica, a lady said to me, so John, what are you going to do now that you're retired? And I really hadn't thought much about it. But the Lord sprang something into my mind just then. And I said to her, I want to spend the rest of my life Proclaiming truth that will produce change. Amen. And I don't want to preach so you can hear a nice sermon. I want that change might occur. Because I'm sure that many, if not most of you, are tired of the same old, same old. We want that God will lift us to a higher plane and to begin a new work in your heart so that we'll, we will be, as Paul often writes, to the praise of his glory. So today, we continue our series on the subject of maturity. And as you who were here last week remember, that your pastor, Pastor Paul, um, introduced us to the 10 levels of maturity. And he gave several definitions of maturity. He spoke of 
maturity as being fully developed. He spoke of maturity as a fully functional state. The stage of development where reproduction is possible. He spoke of the ability to take responsibility for your inheritance, to take care of your father's kingdom affairs, to take responsibility for all that God has for you. And he dealt with the first one, the level of a man's maturity, beg your pardon, the level of one's maturity is his ability to hear from God, step out in faith, and obey what God says. And as I struggle to find a definition of my own, I thought back on the message last week, and I said that level of which pastor spoke is really the essence of maturity. For if a man or a woman can hear from God, and God is always speaking, but the fault is not in God's speaking, the fault is in our hearing. But when a man is able to hear the voice of God, and as a result of what he has heard, to step out in faith, and obey what God has says, wouldn't you agree that that's a mature person? Do you agree? Yes, yes. If you disagree, you must tell me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, here were the levels of maturity of which he spoke. The level of maturity is one's ability to hear from God Step out by faith and obey what God says. Then, to trust in God when things go wrong. To yield your will in submission and obedience. To humble yourself with meekness. To endure hardness as a good soldier, allowing patience to have her perfect work. To forgive and to get over the offense. To give, for you establish your living by your giving. To teach what you have been taught. Keep your focus on your purpose. Stay in the positive lane and have an attitude of gratitude. And number nine, keep your mouth shut. Amen. Maturity lies in the ability to control your tongue. And number 10, let go. In order to go on, decide to grow closer, climb higher, Reach further, go deeper, stay longer, dream bigger. And I can't wait to hear that message. Because in my own heart, there is that desire, there is that dissatisfaction with the status quo. And I want to grow closer to God, to climb higher, to reach further, to go deeper, to stay longer, and to dream bigger. And sometimes we have become so satisfied with the level at which we are. We have become so accustomed to the ordinary that we have ceased to dream bigger. Maybe we have uh, been dreaming maybe of a bigger car or a bigger house or a bigger... But here we're talking about becoming bigger to growing up in Christ and to becoming 
everything that God meant for you to be. I saw someone with a t-shirt this morning that referred to the fact that God knows the plans he has for you. And did you know that God has a plan for you that far exceeds your imagination? One of my favorite verses is, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, the NIV says superabundantly, exceedingly, I'm a King James man, <laughs> above all that you ask or think. And the NIV hits it on the head. All that you ask or imagine. And I want your imaginations this morning to go wild and to begin to imagine what can God do with me? How much further can he take me? I mean, I have been around a long time, as you can maybe observe. But my ambitions have not stopped. My imaginations have not um, ceased to function. And I still have dreams on my heart of what God could do with the remaining weeks or months or years of my life. Because I want to be, like Paul said, to be to the praise of his glory. Yes. I know that God has more for me and for you than you have ever imagined. And I want this morning that you will come into a realization of the possibilities that lie wrapped up in your seeming ordinariness. According to his power that is at work in you. Aren't you simply amazed that the power of God is in you? We're not ordinary people. We are God's special handiwork created in Christ Jesus, to be holy and without blame before him. God has an extraordinary future for you, and I want you to lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of you. For he didn't lay hold of you merely to get you to heaven one day. But God wants to reproduce the very life of God in your ordinary humanity. God doesn't want you to remain at this level of maturity, for there is more ahead. God desires for every believer to not just be a child of God, but for us to be transformed into a more mature child of God. Bishop Holcomb, a friend of Pastor Rowan's, usually say, you must grow up before you go up. And I'm getting ready to go up, so I better grow, f grow up very fast <laughs> because I know that there is more, exceedingly more, than I could ever ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within me. So it is my task today to explore with you another level. The level of my maturity is the ability to yield my will in submission and obedience. To humble myself with meekness. The level of my maturity, can you say it with me? The level of my maturity is the ability to yield my will 
in submission and obedience. To humble myself with meekness. So then, what does it mean to yield? If you're asking that you yield yourself to God in submission and obedience, what does it mean to yield? The word yield has different meanings. Um, Charmaine has planted a lot of fruit trees in her yard. That's, you can say a yard in America? All right. It's okay? It's okay? <laughs> and uh, um, on Friday, my wife and I went down to the orchard <laughs> and we brought up a big um, State of Brothers bag full of plums and what was the other one? Apricots. Because the trees had yielded their fruit. So that's one use of the word. But in this context, to yield means to give up. It means to give away. It means to obey. To obey the whispered promptings of the Holy Spirit. Does anybody here know what it is to get a prompting from the Holy Spirit? Yes. I saw it happen this morning when that young lady came up on to receive uh, Charmaine's prophetic word. Someone in the audience was prompted by the Spirit and he just ran across to her and gave her a cloud. You know what a cloud is, right? <laughs> gave her an envelope with money. He did that in obedience to the voice of the Spirit. And very often, the Spirit... Oh, by the way, do you remember that our God is a speaking God? My sheep, said Jesus, hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. God is always speaking. And if you are born again yes. at all, if you have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you cannot escape the voice of God. He's always talking. My daddy used to pray. I don't know where he got the prayer from, but he... He always says, Lord, give me a heart that trembles at the approach of sin. Have you ever been tempted to do or say something and there's a tremor in your spirit and you know that you're standing on dangerous ground you know that you're approaching something that is not desirable. And that's the peculiar thing about the Spirit of God. He is in you. The Spirit of God dwells. What, says Paul? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Hmm. And in your spirit, which are God's. So God is always talking. And he's calling us to yield. But what we're saying is to yield to the spirit of God that's speaking to you. And so... What is your will? If I am to yield my will, what's that? And will generally is that faculty of the mind 
that selects at the moment of decision a desire among the various options that are present. We went to the fair Friday night, was it Friday night? Mm. And uh, after we had done our presentation, we walked around the fairgrounds and there were lots of delicious delicacies on sale. And I saw some of my number struggling at the moment of decision. Should it be ice cream? Or should it be turkey legs? <laughs> or should it be, what's that cake again? Funnel cake. Funnel cake. You know funnel cake? <laughs> it's a funny cake that they had on sale there. And uh, we all had to make a decision. So the will is when Pastor Paul gets to the ice cream stand and he looks at the options and he turns away. <laughs> That's not for me. And um, so the will determines what we do, what choices we make. And so it's important that the will be turned over, be yielded to God so he can direct our path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Oh, that our paths would be directed by the Lord so we do not make wrong decisions and wrong choices that would lead us away from the path of maturity that God has in store for us. And so when, when the Bible says, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart. You ever wonder what that means? Because I have a heart. It's been pumping. Non-stop. 78 years. And still going. But when I am told to love the Lord with all my heart, does it mean that I'm to love the Lord with all my pump? <laughs> no. No. Our heart in the Bible is not that vital organ in your chest cavity which pumps blood to every part of your body but that invisible, intangible, ruling center of the whole person, the spring of all desires, the seat of intellect, emotions, and will. I say it's intangible because I, I know I have, there's somebody in the audience who had open heart surgery. And they saw her pump, and they primed it. But they couldn't see her real heart, the seat of her emotions, her decision-making faculty, her will. That was something marvelous. That God created in us. Can you imagine? We have such a powerful force within us that is invisible to the human eye. But that's how God made us. And so we are told to guard our hearts. For everything you do flows from that invisible center of the human being. And I want to suggest that I think I've found the perfect example of yielding to the will of God. And I believe that Jesus Christ is that example. Who himself said, my meat 
is to do the will of him that sent me. And I wish that was always our meat. To do the will of the one who has called us. But I think this was displayed in a remarkable way on the Mount of Olives when Jesus was about to be arrested and crucified and just before his crucifixion he took his disciples to the mountain with him and he says watch with me while I go yonder and pray and the Bible says that he went a stone's throw well, I don't know what a stone's throw is it depends on whether it is Charmaine or Roe that's throwing the stone. You know? <laughs> well, he went a stone's throw from them and knelt down and began to pray. He withdrew and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, let this cup Passed from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And he repeated that prayer three times. Such was the anguish of his heart. For he well knew that he would be arrested. He well knew that he would be mocked and jeered. He well knew that he would be beaten. That his back would be furrowed like a field. That his visage would be marred more than any man's. He knew that he would be spat upon. He knew that he would hang on a cross. Held there by nails in his hands and his feet. And as he prayed, Luke's account of it says... And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground. But in the face of that, he says, Yet not my will, but thine be done. In Philippians 2, verses 6 and 8, it is said of God, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that verse in the beginning said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Who, though he was God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And it is that obedience to the will of God that we're talking about because um, Paul said to us, let this same mind, this same attitude be in you which was also in Christ. Many of us have heard from God 
Our emotions have been touched, but our will has not been yielded. And I remind you that as long as you are a breathing child of God, you will never escape the voice of God as he prompts you for one thing or another. And sometimes as God speaks to us, we are convinced in our mind. We are even emotionally moved. But our wills have not been yielded. I remember many years ago when I was about 19, I was in the Jamaica's National Arena and the president of, the then president of Youth for Christ was the speaker. And as he broke the word of God to us, I was moved. I heard that call of God upon my life. Thousands of people were there, but I went to the altar because I felt God calling me to ministry. But the problem was, with all my emotional response, I needed my will to trip in. And having heard the call of God, I went on for about 15 years before my stubborn will yielded. You see, as a young man, I had dreams of things I wanted to accomplish, things I wanted to have, things I wanted to do. And if I yielded my will to God, then those plans perhaps wouldn't work. And very often, when we hear God's call, we fail to obey because of our own problems, our own dreams, the things that we want to acquire or achieve. And it took me 15 years before I finally yielded. I remember one time, my father was preaching from John chapter 1. And he says, he was reading that passage, and he read, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And as you know, my name is John. So I trembled because it was a nudge from God to remind me of the commitment I made at the age 19. God is so merciful. He doesn't give up on us. And he, he kept at me until at last I yielded. But then, I've been talking so far about the individual Yielding of your will to God, which is very important. But there is also a corporate yielding of ourselves to God. For we are the body of Christ, and God wants the body of Christ to be yielded to his will. So there's a sense in which it is both individual and corporate. And for this, I want to read a special uh, passage of scripture. And uh, as is our custom, 
when we are reading the word of God, we like to stand in acknowledgement that this is the word of the Lord. So I'm going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 4, and it's the longest passage, 16 verses. I hope you can stand that long. <laughs> I mean, if I can, I'm sure you can. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 1. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned. This is what, why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he was descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And listen to this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. These are gifts of the Spirit to the church. And what is their purpose? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until, this is the next word, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And this is the word of the Lord. See. So in order to facilitate the ministry of the church, the body of Christ, or rather in order to facilitate the maturity of the church, the body of Christ, Christ gave to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And I believe that God in his uh, grace and mercy has given these gifts to the church. We may not yet recognize them all, but God has given these um, offices to the church, these gifts rather to the church, so that they have the job of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry until, until we all, say we all, until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ.
And God doesn't want anyone here to be left behind. Until we all reach unity, until we all attain unto the measure of the fullness of Christ. And that's God's design for every one of us or for each one of us. And that means you. God wants you to attain unto the full measure of the fullness of Christ. And what a level of maturity that is, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That sounds like God wants us to be like Christ, doesn't it? Yes. And we, we, we haven't quite got there yet. But that's God's plan for you. And when your t-shirt says, I know the plans I have for you, there you have it. God's plan for you is that you attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And that we together should attain that measure of the fullness of Christ. In Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church, he prays. At the end of his prayer, he says, That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And I says, Me? And the Spirit says, yes, you. That we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And I remembered my grandfather. He was a businessman, but he was also a farmer at heart. And everywhere we lived, there was a little plantation in the back of the yard. And he had plantains. Anybody knows plantains? Yes. Plantains and bananas and so on. And my grandfather's bananas weren't like the ones that you eat every day. Because he didn't pick them while they were green and sent them on a ship. And they traveled for quite a while before they got to Stater Brothers and before you got them. And sometimes when I get those from the supermarket and I peel them, they're, they're a little stainy, you know? But in Jamaica, at my grandfather's farm, the bananas would remain on the trees until they're yellow. And they are just bursting with full sun-ripened goodness. And sometimes my grandfather would bring up some, you know, from the backyard. And he would say to me, and I hope you can understand a little Jamaican. He says, John, the banana fit till it busts. <laughs> and I don't know if you can understand that. But what happens is that when they get fit and ripened on the tree, they burst at the seams. And when Paul says... That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. It means that I will be burst into capacity with all that God is. There is no room for mediocrity there. I will be filled to capacity with the fullness of God. And that is what Paul is talking about. The fullness of Christ. It is a church fully saturated with Christ. Fully in relationship with Christ. Fully embracing and embodying the presence of Christ in the world. 
The fullness of Christ is a church actually being all that God intends it to be. The people of God together, fully alive and flourishing, fully like Christ. The level of my maturity is the ability to yield my will in submission and obedience. And submission means to place oneself voluntarily under God's purpose and plan for your life. Submission is to stop trying to fight or resist the striving within us. To agree to do what God has been saying to you rather than not know, Lord. Let me get married first. Let me get my house first. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says, put off your former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Can you imagine that you and I were created Not just to be ordinary. We are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And that's what God wants of us. And if you have been born again since the Spirit of God indwells you, God has been calling you to another level of maturity attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. To be like God in true righteousness and holiness. But perhaps you have not yielded your will in submission and obedience. I don't want to, I can't afford to lose that relationship that I'm in. I don't want to lose that job about which I have some, you know, little hesitancy. I don't want to get rid of that questionable activity. I don't want to be really free from that sweet addiction, that immoral practice, that resentment that I have in my heart for somebody who has hurt me. In Romans 6, 19, we read, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now, Yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. And as we do that individually, and as all of us do it together as an assembly of God's people, the body of Christ will grow and mature. The measure of my maturity is the ability to yield my will in submission and obedience. I close with a story of a man who my father led to Christ. And uh, he came to Christ on a Sunday night 
And on Monday morning, he went to work and he handed in his resignation. What? Yeah. You see, he was a rum salesman. You know rum, alcohol? <laughs> you guys are nice guys. You don't know about those things. But, <laughs> but he was a salesman for a product that was ruining the lives of many people. That had split many families. That have lost many fortunes. And he knew that if God had called him, he could not continue in that questionable line of business. He was just a babe in Christ. But he heard the voice of God. He stepped out in faith and obeyed what God had said to him. And uh, he yielded his will in submission and obedience. My church was a funny church. They had some bad hymns. Hmm. Can you imagine? I hated those hymns because they made me uncomfortable. And one hymn said, Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. And if you think that was a bad verse, listen to another verse. The other verse says, Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Another verse says, and I used to love secular music, and it says, take my voice and let me sing always, only for my king. So that means I couldn't Sing Elvis Presley and Fats Domino and whoever because my voice was to be given to God. So, so you understand why I didn't like those hymns. But God has been speaking to you this morning about areas of our lives that need to be submitted to the will of God. I ask the musicians to do a final song which says, I give myself away so you can use me. Here I am. Here I stand. Lord, my life is in your hand. Lord, I'm longing to see your desires revealed in me. Take my heart. Take my life as a living sacrifice. All my dreams, all my plans, Lord, I place them in your hands. And I want you to make that kind of commitment to God this morning. For God is calling you individually and he's calling us collectively to make that submission to God. And the measure of your maturity would be your willingness to yield your will in submission to God. Don't be like me who waited 15 years before I answered the call of God. 
And if God has been saying anything to you, then while these, oh, this <laughs> member of the singing group leads us in this song, <laughs> I, I, I want you to join me here because I am making that commitment. I don't know how many years or weeks or days or hours God has in store for me, but I want the, that amount of time to be used of God. And so I'm giving myself away and I want you to come and join me and let us just give ourselves up to God.